All right. Well, welcome, folks. I know everybody is starting to log in uh, and be joining us here. So thank you very much for spending uh, some of your afternoon with us. And we are going to get started here in, as people are logging in. Um, as normal, this is, um, you know, Ask Me Field Anything. This is a, a monthly webinar series that we do where we like to talk about just topics that are relating to the solar and solar plus storage industries. And today we have a, a great topic uh, talking about kind of an urban mic microgrid and, and kind of some lessons learned within that. So got a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, and so I appreciate folks who are joining and also folks who uh, sent in some questions ahead of time. We were just reviewing those, trying to, well, we reviewed them earlier. So we're gonna try and incorporate those as much as we can. Um, if we are not able to get your questions, then you know by all means, uh, feel free to, to follow up with us and we'll get you our contact info at the end. Um, one of the things that we ask is when you are, um, we're, we're, we encourage questions throughout uh, today's webinar. And so uh, if you can use the Q&A function, not the chat function, it just becomes a lot, it's a lot easier for us to manage, be able to see those and make sure that we're addressing things. So there's the Q&A versus the chat. So Q&A is the best place to put those. And again, happy to, to see folks and have, uh, have some interaction with that. All right. So I'm gonna jump in and um, you know, kind of start talking about this. And you know, we are lucky, uh, we have Craig Collins uh, from PAE Consulting Engineers and um, PAE has a uh, living microgrid. They have a, a building um, that in downtown Portland where a lot of these lessons learned have um, been coming from. So um, Craig, would you mind just you know, introducing yourself to the audience and kind of, you know, where, what your position is at PAE. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Ryan. Um, excited to be joining you today. Uh, I am an associate at PAE. I've worked in the um, electrical or work in the electrical department, and I specialize in microgrid system design. Um, have kind of come up in the photovoltaic and battery energy storage system design ranks, mostly PV for uh, more than a decade. Um, and these days, it's mostly microgrids most of the time. So uh, in the living building um, in downtown Portland was one of the first two microgrid systems that I did in the, the Portland metro area. Uh, the Beaverton Public Safety Center was another one that was a, an early one for PAE and for myself. So I'm excited to share what I've learned. Uh, well, really appreciate you jumping on and uh, excited to kind of get into it. So. On the front end, a couple of things, a little bit about Mayfield and then um, PAE as well. And so for those of you who may not know Mayfield Renewables, you know, we are a um, consulting engineering company. We do project engineering and then a, lot, a big part of what we do as well as education and training. So kind of uh, have a, a unique um, approach to the engineering side of things. And this webinar is a good example of the education and training that we do. So we do a lot of stuff put it out there uh, in this type of environment. Um, and then we also do a number of classes that are available on our website. And we also do you know, uh, classes for teams and things like that. So we'll have a little bit about us also at the end. So you know, if, um, if you have any questions, we'd love to, to talk with people and see if we might be able to help and support. And then PAE, um, maybe Craig, I should let you kind of talk about this, kind of you know, what your focus is um, in, in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, PAE is a an MEP firm. Uh, we offer a full suite of uh, of MEP services to to architects as well as to to end clients and building owners. Um, we extend that with technology, lighting design, and fire protection as well. Uh, the department that I work in in PAE is kind of a sub department of the electrical group, uh, where the uh, the renewable energy services department and we're kind of a, a hybrid group of building energy modelers which is our regenerative design team as well as our electrical and we specialize again in microgrid system and renewable energy system design and we leverage that uh, building energy modeling uh, expertise and electrical design expertise together to provide uh, deep consulting expertise to our clients Awesome. Yeah. So I know there's some definite crossover here, a uh, little bit of uh, maybe friendly competitors are on, in some levels, but uh, uh, definitely great to, you know, work with you guys. And and I think that the the work that you guys have been doing has been been awesome. So uh, glad yeah. to have you here. Um, 
So yeah, so today the, on the Ask Me Field Anything, so lessons learned from an urban microgrid. And again, this is um, something that PAE was, you know, it's one of the buildings that they're in. So um, you kind of have this poll here for you to, to um, jump into if, you know, give us a little bit of input on who you are and what you're kind of looking for here. And we'll leave that open for a minute as we introduce the topic. Um, so we're gonna go through some very specific things and judging by the questions that we received ahead of time, you know, there's definitely some similar things that people are interested in asking about. And so hopefully give you some of this, uh, some things to think about um, in these environments. And, you know, we labeled it urban microgrid and there's definitely some very specific things and we're gonna get into the utility interconnection specifically and, and how that played a role in PAE's approach on their building. A lot of this though, you know, quite honestly, is it's not gonna necessarily be in the, um, unique to, to that environment. And so we will definitely talk about um, some other things as well as we're, as we're going through on this. Um, one of the things that Mayfield has really been focused in on and talk, and and as well as the engineering side are, you know, planning the feasibility. So we'll talk, touch on that, this utility interconnection and the unique things that uh, PAE was up against in this environment. And then we'll talk about some of these uh, other topics around specifics around energy storage, the, the inverters, how they interact uh, with both the utility and the loads. So it's actually some interesting stuff that in the preparation, I was definitely learning some stuff from Craig. So appreciate that. So on the front end, um, you know, just talking about feasibility, and we have this, you know, list of uh, bullets here that are, you know, reasons to perform a feasibility study. And so this is one, Craig, you know, I'm happy to get your input on this as well. One of the things that we see are more and more people asking for feasibility studies, which is great. Um, we've had, historically, we have been approached by clients saying, I have a X kilowatt PV array. I have an X kilowatt hour um, energy storage system. Let's put it all together and let's make it work. Uh, and you know, the question you know is like, well, what's what are the purposes? What's how did this? How did you come up with those numbers? You know, what are the loads that you're supposed to that you're desiring to run? All these kinds of things. Uh, and when a feasibility study is not done ahead of time, it definitely makes it harder to understand you know the purpose of the microgrid, how it's going to work is it going to serve the needs of the clients what they have in their in their mind of being able to use it so these are definitely um, things to consider and i think a big part of it um, as craig is going to touch on in a bit is you know this drive decision making and the basis of design so understanding the the inverters that we're going to use understanding how it's going to interact um, and, and those kinds of things is an important aspect of that not sure, Craig, if you have more you would like yeah. to kind of add to that. Sure. I think that the for for me and, and generally on most projects, uh the the challenge is determining the load. Like unless you're in the, the really fortunate circumstance of having uh a very large photovoltaic array, a very large battery, a very large generator, or some other type of of significant supply side asset relative to your to your facility load, you're generally constrained by the amount of power and energy that you can deliver and store um, throughout the course of a day or throughout the course of your resiliency duration. And so identifying with the client and doing the work to figure out what the load is, how long that load needs to be resilient, does that load need to adapt? So, or can it adapt? So do, do we want to have a full facility be resilient for X number of days, or do we we want to try to 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 value engineer the microgrid to provide just the minimum resiliency function with the minimum amount of supply side assets? That's the challenge. And at PAE, we've actually developed a few uh, custom tools that help the owner to map our building modeling to that resiliency um, scenario. So we we actually provide them a tool that they can run some of their own scenario analysis and then develop their own custom load profile. And for those of you that are, that are familiar with doing like Homer energy modeling or Zindi modeling so that you're determining what assets are going to be viable 
or your microgrid system, you know that you're creating another one of those models almost every single load profile that you have to consider. And so the number of, by reducing the number of iterations, you really can streamline and make the microgrid feasibility process more cost-effective to your company and to your client. Yeah, no, that's a great, great point. And I know that's something that we do on our end as well. So we're doing a lot of modeling and, you know, having to, uh, the load studies is a hard part and kind of creating those, um, those load profiles uh, is there's, there's an art and a science to it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, trying not to recreate it too much, but getting realistic answers for the clients is a really important aspect of it. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's actually a question along these lines and kind of while we're talking about this, uh, TJ over at ANR Solar uh, put a question in ahead of time. And so um, talking about modeling and energy usage in, so the question was specifically around any bi-directional charging. Um, so I think that might be a big topic in of itself being, um, which you know, we'll talk a little bit about, but, um, but then also asking about a generator. So kind of wanted to touch on multiple power sources in, in the feasibility aspect or, or things like that. And so I'm not sure exactly, I didn't ask this question to you beforehand, Craig, if, if a generator is involved at, at your building. Um, but I know that's something that we do a lot. We're in, incorporating those other sources of power. So I guess specifically for, for the question, and is that something that you guys have and incorporated into your design? We did not. Uh, in fact, we, we could not because of the um, requirements of the living building challenge. Uh, okay. There were not allowed to have any on-site combustion, so okay. that even includes like gas cooking. Um, oh. So we we did not have a, a, an emergency generator or or a standby generator to supplement our photovoltaic and battery system at the microgrid. So we had to take a really aggressive load shedding scenario for for like long-term resiliency for the for the living building, and we had to do some pretty interesting. Uh, things with regards to additional battery systems to supply for the emergency lighting, which is more conventional, but also a UPS battery system for the elevator because we were required to have a legally required source of power for our elevator, but without a generator. So I think that that's going to be on the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but uh, the yeah. living building challenge introduces uh a, a bunch of, of different, um, well, challenges as you work through the design process. No, that's, that's all interesting stuff. Yeah. So obviously we're not gonna have enough time to get too deep into any of that, but that's, uh, interesting aspects. And, um, just what you were saying about the legally required standby systems and things like that. Um, we're not going to dive too far into my favorite topics of code, but, um, that's definitely part of, part of the, uh, that basis of design kind of what people need to be taking into account as you're, as you're doing it. So, yeah. And I, I guess I could offer that uh, we've we've done some some analysis recently, showing like the trade offs in like total life cycle carbon um, between a very large battery system to provide for a long duration resiliency objective mm -hmm. versus a smaller battery system with a smaller generator to supplement mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm actually have found in many instances that the smaller battery with the smaller gen set, especially if that gen set only has to run to cover like a very slim number of the total outage, the potential outage hours mm -hmm. is actually like a better uh, investment decision if you're looking at the life cycle carbon analysis. Yeah, and that's actually, I, that's a great kind of aspect, a great thing to think about. And um, I think we've um, looked at it similar, but not quite, I, we, I don't think we've looked at it in the carbon. So that's that's a great way of thinking about it. But the other thing is, you know, understanding the generator, you know, if you put in a big, huge generator that's only running at 10% of its capacity, it's not gonna be as efficient as it can. And so matching those, the source, the generator source with the loads will make it so that your, your whole system is gonna operate more efficiently. And so, um, yeah, sometimes you walk into a building and the generator's there, right? You don't get to make that choice, but when you can, making it, optimizing it for that output is is a great, great thing. Uh, so yeah, so on this image, just kind of, uh, you know, identifying some of the major components. We're gonna, you're gonna see some images like this again in the in the coming slides uh, when it comes to some specific uh, use cases that um, that Craig had to go through. But the idea here, you know, this is a much more complex system. Uh, microgrids 
you know, they're going to have some sort of generation source. We're going to be interconnecting with the utility. We're going to have loads involved, storage. And then a handful of questions came in about the microgrid controllers. So we'll talk about those here in a few minutes. Uh, but the microgrid controller being, you know, one of the most critical pieces of the whole thing. So, you know, as we're going through, just, just recognizing that there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of individual pieces, making sure that they are talking to each other, that they're connected properly. And, you know, we are interconnecting with the utility as well um, in a way that they're comfortable with. All right. So let's talk about the, the urban area network and, you know, talking about utility interconnection kind of, I think, in general. And so, Craig, I'll kind of let you lead this. And so we, you know, we have the kickoff there with these Oregon administrative rules. And so we'll, we'll talk about the, the grid configurations. And uh, I know there's some very specific things in Oregon and Portland. Uh, I know that also other cities in the Northwest, Seattle specifically, we've had to deal with some of this stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, in Oregon, and I think this is true in in other areas where we uh, where you may have area networks. Generally, they're found in downtown urban areas of major cities. Um, but in Oregon, at least the uh, the ability to connect customer renewables to that type of area network or that type of grid topology, known as an area network, is pretty highly constrained um, and constrained for good reason. And we'll talk about that here soon. But in uh, in the OARs, there is a, is a limitation for the total of customer renewables connected to an area network. So the total in aggregate to be limited to, I believe it's 10% of the minimum daytime load on that area network. So when you file for your interconnection agreement, um, or interconnection application with utility, they will look at that minimum daytime load and then look at the rest of the customer renewables that are already connected to that area network, compare that against 10% of that minimum daytime loading on that area network and determine whether or not there's any headroom, so to speak, for, for additional customer renewables on the grid. And when we filed for our interconnection application at the living building, uh, we consumed the last of that headroom. Um, but the the value that we got back in terms of what we could export to the area network, and typically this would mean the size of the photovoltaic system that you could construct, was quite a bit smaller than what our photovoltaic system on the living building is. So our net export uh, allowance for our building on this area network was only around 50 kW. Uh, we were targeting and ultimately constructed a 133 uh, kW photovoltaic system on the building. And so there's a, a, a big disparity between the size of the system that we went with and needed in order to achieve some of the net zero energy goals of the living building challenge versus the constraints of connecting renewables to an area network based on the OARs. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe you can. Uh... Well, yeah, it, I think it's interesting. And, and I will I'll add a little maybe flavor of this as well in terms of that interconnect requirement or, you know, kind of what, um, what we've seen. And so the picture there actually is interesting because this was a, this was actually taken in Seattle the downtown grid um, was exactly what we're talking about this this network grid and this specific job didn't have any requirements and then we come back a year later and have another pv system that's interconnected and it did have the requirement so kind of to the point that you said there craig the yep. those thresholds had been hit so enough solar had been put in on this network grid that the utility is now saying okay we've met we've met our minimums and so now we have to start controlling anything that's coming on this one specifically has nothing to do with batteries. There was, it's just straight PV. And so in this situation, we, um, you know, talked about, so there's a um, minimum import requirement from the utility in this case. And so we have kind of what the, what those approaches are from the utility. This one was, there was that building will always be consuming power. And we had to set up a metering system and a control system in such a way that if the, if the building load drops below, in this case, it was five kilowatts, 
then we have to throttle back the solar. And it's been been watching that do that. It's been interesting watching the the building load drop, the solar's producing a lot, uh, and then the metering actually uh, controlling that. So that is a different another way of of making those kinds of controls. Yeah, that was that was the my first exposure to area networks was very similar to that. It was uh, downtown Seattle. Uh, it was actually the Seattle Aquarium. And same requirement, we had to do a minimum import relay and we had to curtail the photovoltaics. It was the only answer available to us at the time. And we also didn't really have any of the smart inverter Modbus control profiles that we do today. So we had to do it with a series of, of contactors where the uh, inverters feeder between the breaker for the inverter and the inverter itself had a, had a series of contactors and we would actually stage in or out the amount of photovoltaic capacity to make sure we were always doing that minimum import. I'm. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to 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 deploy more elaborate and more creative solutions these days. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we'll show this or we'll talk about this this more. But you know, we were able to um, achieve our net zero energy goals at the living building with the battery system and a microgrid controller, staying within that that 50 kW uh, net export constraint and we were able to proceed with that that significantly larger photovoltaic array and we dynamically curtail the photovoltaic system like in real time so in instead of having to to drop a whole inverter off and design a, the photovoltaic system with lots of smaller string inverters and what would be ideal we we kind of designed the array as you normally would and we used our microgrid control system to uh, affect the curtailment of the the photovoltaic system and the ideal objective is we don't curtail the photovoltaic system at all. We we use the battery system to uh, time shift our photovoltaic production. So we we export as much as we possibly can when we can. Anything that we we can produce that would be in excess of that net export constraint, we charge the battery system with that quote unquote surplus energy. And then we wait until the evening hours when the photovoltaic system production is dropping off. And then the battery system discharges, again, staying below the net export constraint, discharges itself down to a minimum state of charge. And we're not holding really anything back for resiliency. We're, our primary objective is, is grid connected. Oh, and then we uh, we repeat the process every single day. Oh, okay. So while we're on the kind of somewhat on the topic of the controls, um, and that it, we wanted to talk about. So I think this is a good time as any to kind of throw it in there. Um, so talking about, so the question was how control systems or EMS um, play an important part, how they play an important part of the system. So kind of a question of, you know, and, and Craig, I think you had some, some good input on that uh, in terms of the requirements around um, the control system with respect to the energy storage itself. Yeah, um, critically important. Uh, the, the our system at the living building would not function either for its grid connected operation or for its off grid operation without the microgrid control system. Neither the the you know photovoltaic inverters and their onboard control uh, availabilities would be able to be leveraged and actually realized uh, without the microgrid control system. And the same thing for the for the battery system as well. You need to have uh, basically like a building level or plant level control system that's coordinating the activities of the PV and the battery system, and also uh, having the the real time situational awareness of of pulling information from metering in order to make smart decisions in the moment about what those those two systems in our case or if you were to have a generator system or others what they should be doing at that moment of time um so whether it's just trying to produce as much energy as possible or save as much energy as possible or to optimize for the economics of your energy costs all of those will require a micrograde controller or some kind of um plant operations controller let's say if you're not going to island you may not may not be a microgrid controller but some type of plc to coordinate the the operation of those systems yeah and one of the things that i would just kind of add on to that is this is a um i would agree it's you know critically important and there are a number of controllers that are out there do, 
serving different needs. And so kind of, you know, understanding, and I think Craig, you mentioned some, some names that you, that you guys maybe use here, um, maybe you've used in other jobs. Um, one of the things that's coming up for folks to be aware of, uh, we've been talking about this at Mayfield. Um, we've been putting uh, a chair out there around a new UL standard around 3141 around energy management and power control. So we're gonna start seeing this in, in code. Uh, we're gonna start seeing these references to this. And so these are um, standards that are gonna be out there in terms of being able to control these systems as, as a whole, not just the individual, not just controlling the power output, but managing the loads, matching loads and sources and things like that. And so, um, so that's good. It's, it's written, it's getting, it's in the process of being um, ratified and everything. So we're not quite there yet, but we will be there um, relatively soon. Um, and so very, kind of very excited for that direction yes. that the industry is heading, like uh, very much looking for the, the future of our design efforts to, to be simplified by being able to depend on UL standards to to help me think make things more similar rather than more different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so it's kind of it's marrying up these what we have in our inverters, our seventeen forty one inverters. And um, you know, I've, I've coming off coming off of a week of talking uh, code in the twenty twenty six code, and this was a big topic. This was a huge part of the the conversations around Article seven hundred six and things like that. So this is a lot of people have their eyes on this in our it's going to be a big part of what we do as an industry. Um, and so question that came in, and I think that's kind of along these same lines from Jeff asking about, do they allow you to limit export through software control? And for the project that I was referring to, yes, they being the utility, uh, that was who put the requirement in place. And so we were able to use through metering and through communication through the, to the, the metering communicating directly with the inverters, be able to throttle those inverters. Um, I guess I'm curious, Craig, if that's a similar answer for, for your living building. Yeah, it is. Uh, but what we, because we didn't know exactly what the utility was going to require for this, and we wanted to be uh, confident that they would, they would find our solution um, favorable. We also backed up our microgrid control system with an additional relay. So we used the what's now become kind of a very common relay for microgrid control systems and um, the supervising of the, the grid isolation device or microgrid isolation device. We used a SCL 751 at that at that main breaker and that point of common coupling with the utility. Mm -hmm. So that and it's set with two different reverse or, or power uh, tripping elements. So it's looking for reverse power, i.e. power back out to the utility. And if the microgrid control system, for whatever reason, was to fail in its task of managing our assets, and we were to get more than the allowance uh, of net export, the relay would detect that. And then it trips offline the photovoltaic and battery system, not the entire building. It it makes sure that it it hard trips off our distributed energy resources, oh, okay. and then we go back to being like a you know basically a, a PV and batteryless customer for a while, while those systems are locked out, and then it requires a an operator intervention to come and do some forensics, figure out what happened, uh, basically call tech support. Um, and and then we can restore it manually, uh, and and that was something that the utility actually really appreciated was that we had kind of a fallback relay based strategy, and we could send them the relay programming files for them to review. And so we're like, you know, we're we're doing our best to commission and design, or you know, design and commission the microgrid system to not ever need that relay to operate. That's the objective: is it just is always watching but never doing, but. We did have some experiences through commissioning where it tripped and we had to go and figure out why and we had to tune the control systems to be uh, faster so mm -hmm. that we weren't encroaching on our uh, max export limitation. Great. Yeah. And this kind of, um, again, another question that came in ahead of time was kind of asking about the the best controllers for microgrids. I'm not sure if there's uh, a way of quantifying the best ones. Um, but yeah, Kelly um, asked the question about you know, what some of those controllers are. And you mentioned the, the SCL 751, not really a 
per se a, um, a microgrid controller, but it is you know, using it as a microgrid interconnect device, I guess you could say, or that disconnect. That's something that we're seeing being used across the country. The utilities know and trust and understand those SEL um, relays and the contactors. And so it's um, it path of least resistance, I guess, in a lot of ways of being able to make sure that we have this disconnect, we have this positive disconnect from the utility. Um, yeah. And, you know, some of the, the controllers and the load controllers, again, getting into that 3141, getting into these microgrid controller specific, or these companies that are doing microgrid controllers, integrating those components. So now we are doing both load and power um, control uh, of our, both our generating assets and our loads. Right. And the, the other thing that we that we thought about for the the living building and we've we've incorporated on on it and as well as other microgrid designs recently is that we've we've anticipated the utilities to apply the same logic that they had applied to the photovoltaic system disconnecting means uh, where they wanted a visible open or they wanted some mechanical mm -hmm. means and or visible means of making sure that that distributed energy resource is disconnected from their utility. Whether that's for an outage event and they just want to make sure that there's no possibility that that um, distributed asset was to to reverse energize the the distribution lines, or they're doing local uh, servicing of the metering equipment, and so they want to make sure that they they can't get energization from the the customer side of a of a meter. So what we did at the living building was ahead of the grid isolation device, so ahead of the breaker that's supervised by that relay, we included a uh, another circuit breaker with a lockable hasp. Um, and in other utility regions, you might include a uh, like a bolted pressure switch or Pringle switch with mm -hmm. a visible open inspection means ahead of your grid isolation device. I think it's um, it's a belts and suspenders, but utilities generally like that approach. Um, and so uh, I think that's your most sort of cautious and a most robust solution, but you could always negotiate with the utility whether or not they might want to just have a locking hasp on your grid isolation device itself so that it could be opened and locked open and not be able to be reclosed. Um, that could that could be acceptable, but you'd have to have some way to let the microgrid controller know that it shouldn't make an attempt to close that breaker while it's locked out, because it could be working against a you know mechanical constraint. So, I've taken the approach of putting in a, a lockable provision ahead of the grid isolation device in most instances now. Gotcha. No, that that makes a lot of sense, and it uh, like you said, the utilities I think tend to uh, appreciate the the belt and suspenders method. So. Uh, sometimes it's it's nice to, to be able to put in there. Um, so yeah, so let's I'm gonna keep us moving forward here a little bit just because I know that we're we've got more to say. And so um, let's talk a little bit about these typical these grid configurations and kind of give people this first this um, you know radial grid and then uh, talk about the area network grid. And yeah. so Craig, I'll kind of let you take the lead on on this sure. one um, so that we can kind of set or We've been talking about it, so kind of give people a little bit more um, background on, on what these are. Yeah, so we're looking at a configuration of, of or a graphical representation of what a radial grid, grid might look like. So this is not what is, is downtown uh, Portland, but that is the living building there on the right. And if downtown had a radial grid distribution or our living building was connected to a radial grid, we would design a um, we would design in concert with the utility a, a single service transformer for our building. That service transformer would be fed off of a medium voltage distribution network that would probably be you know running continuously down the street with various splice points, either in uh, you know in our case in an urban environment, probably underground in manholes, and then that from that splice point volt you would extend from that manhole to a, a new service transformer for your building. And that transformer would be dedicated to your building uh, and the building next to it would have its own, but you would all be connected to a single um, common medium voltage primary network. And you would just have a single uh, service transformer for your, for your building. Um, so pretty common, you, you'd see this, you know, in residential neighborhoods too, but you might have multiple houses on one transformer on a pole top. Um, but this is your, typical configuration for most utility distribution arrangements 
in the country outside of uh, dense urban areas. Right. Yeah. So just to make clear, this is kind of the, I don't want to say the normal because it's not abnormal to have the, the one we're about to show, but uh, this is maybe the more um, common uh, approach or the common utility that we would be, we'd be seeing that we're interconnecting with. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then in contrast to the area network grid. Yeah. So we, I just want to say that I'm not an expert on area network design and nor do we know the specifics of the area network that is in downtown Portland. That information is, uh, you know, unique and guarded by, um, by PGE, uh, which is the utility in, in, in Portland. Um, but the, the general idea is that in an area network, you have multiple utility feeders that then feed multiple transformers. And those transformers, the secondaries of those transformers are paralleled together. And then the, the parallel network of those transformers are then distributed to the individual buildings. So we did not have to um, purchase a dedicated transformer or the utility did not have to provide a new dedicated transformer for our building. They, they may have, I can't recall, upgraded one or more of the transformers in the area network when our building was added. So they're looking at like the total load of the aggregate of the buildings on that area network. The area network is in our case, 208 volt. So you have 208 volt secondaries that are all paralleled together and then they're distributing to the, to the buildings. Um, so somewhat unique in that, you know, there wasn't a 480 volt service available to us because the area network was inherently 208 volt. Mm -hmm. The, the reason why this is done is that if you lose, like in this graphic example, if, if you were to have an outage on utility feeder one, which might be coming from substation one, utility feeder two from substation two and three from three, et cetera, that if you were to lose one of those substation feeders, whether there's a fault on it or whether it's just down for maintenance, you still have utility feeders two and three and the associated transformers to be able to carry the 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 area network now i don't i don't know whether or not you know it's a n plus 1 or n plus 2 type configuration where you could go all the way down to just a single utility feeder and still be able to carry the network those are some of the decisions that you know the the pge network engineers uh are designing for but i don't have any insight into what what i do know is that the the transformers are are also equipped with what are called network protectors and those network protectors are designed um, much like the relay inside of our building to watch for reverse power flow. So power flow happening in or power current flow happening in, in the direction that's not anticipated and to then trip offline the transformer um, and isolate it to protect both the transformer as well as the, the medium voltage primary from a potential fault condition. And if you were to imagine here, so using again as utility feeder one is our problematic feeder. If, <clears throat> if you were to have a fault on utility feeder one on the medium voltage side of that utility feeder, um, so upstream of the transformer, then the other, the other transformers and the other utility feeders would be able to feed that fault. So you would have current coming both from the substation on utility feeder one, but you would also have current that would be coming from the substation on two and three making its way to that fault through those transformers and you know to the faulted point on utility feeder one. And those network protectors are there to prevent that from happening and to protect the equipment and I, I would suppose reduce the amount of available fault current um, to, to that fault, or at least the duration that that fault current could persist. So the, the challenge with that is that if you have a lot of customer renewables on your area network, Let's say you were hypothetically had an area network that was, you know, uh, at times able to have enough renewables to reach like near a, a net zero power point. So even though that's against what the administrative rules would just hypothetically consider that, then you would have power flow going backwards through those network protectors and onto the utility feeders. So basically, you'd be like, you know, net zero power or net positive power. But the network protectors are there to prevent that. And what the utility does not want to have happen is that the customer renewables on the customer side, the secondary sides of those transformers 
have the potential to trip those network protectors and cause an unintentional outage. And so that's really the driving factor, again, as I understand it, behind why the the Oregon administrative rules are the way they are and, and why the, um, the threshold for the total amount of customer renewables on area network is quite limited. Yeah, and that was like, as you were explaining to me in our prep sessions, that that makes a lot more sense than like, right? because it's not the transformers, it's not necessarily even the utility that the, the medium voltage lines that are at risk here, it's those network protector, protectors. And so their entire job there is to look for power coming the, you know, in their minds, the wrong way, uh, right. flowing back towards the utility, not from the utility to the load. And so it's just a function of how they were built and what those, what those are, you know, how they're working. And so if we start to get back beat on those, then yeah, that's going to cause problems and then could have a, you know, bigger effect on that. So all of that made a lot more sense, you know, and this is something I remember running into this, gosh, 15 plus years ago when, you know, doing systems in downtown Portland specifically and, um, I think that there was a, a a big worry amongst the utility, you know, like at that time it was like, nope, you can't do anything on, and that was, it was just a blanket. No, you can't do any sort of uh, interconnection on there. So, um, and so somebody actually asked the question and I'll, you know, kind of throw it out there now talking about utilities, you know, have you run into, um, I guess the question is about, you know, how, how are you dealing with utilities and kind of getting in this information? Yeah. You know, what part of the process are you guys uh, talking to them on, on this? For the for our project of the living building, and I would advise this for any project that you're undertaking in in a downtown area, and and even for that matter these days, especially if you're doing projects in California or other areas where there's a, a high uh, customer adoption of renewables, even if you're still on a on a radial network, that to reach out to the utility uh, net metering and interconnection departments and talk to them about the um, the availability to interconnect renewables. You know, certain utilities in California now have to share their interconnection uh, capacity allowance maps that are sometimes updated, sometimes not, but it's a great starting point. Um, but in our case, we were able to get connected with, with PGE and start talking to them about our plans and get some early information about, you know, are we going to be constrained? The feedback was yes, you probably are likely going to be constrained. And then we asked, well, do you, can you tell us what our constraint is? Like, no, well, we actually can't give you your number until you do file your interconnection application formally. Um, so we basically planned on knowing that we were going to have a constraint that was probably going to be lower than what our plans build out of photovoltaics were going to be on our roof. And then we move forward knowing that we had those elements in our design. So it wasn't a, a price shock for us down the road. And then once we got the information back through the interconnection um, application process, we basically it was it was set points at that point. So we knew what our set points were after we got that information back. But we already knew the extent of the complexity that we were going to have to accommodate in those early uh, conversations with utility. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, getting involved early and understanding uh, what those limitations are, uh, you know, if this network grid exists and, and all those. I'm going to um, kind of roll a couple questions into one because they're they're definitely related. And so the, one of the questions came up was if you hit your max export, so your PV systems, you know, doing great. Um, you mentioned about discharging your batteries every night. If you get to the point and, you know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but um, the batteries are then full again the next day. Your solar is still doing really well, and yep. you're hitting that max export limit. Um, my presumption, my I think I know the answer is you know the controller in this case is going to throttle back the inverters. It's going to control the output of those inverters just to make sure that you don't exceed that max export. Is that a correct way of uh, characterizing that? That's correct. The yeah. we have two solar edge inverters, and they have a, a Modbus register for control. That's a percent nameplate um, power, okay. and so if you set that Modbus register to fifty percent on each, that inverter can only produce fifty percent of its nameplate at max. So even if it has the the DC side capability of producing its rated nameplate it will read that Modbus register and curtail itself to 50% max. And we update that register uh, on a sub-second basis. Basically, the yeah. we have a Schneider Electric EcoStructure microgrid controller 
and it's running exactly that routine, looking at that battery state of charge. When we get are getting close to full, but not full, we, we start to kind of reduce the charge power to the battery system, but also start to, to bring in the curtailment. And we kind of like transition from a uh, no curtailment charging mindset into a, um, into a, a slow charging and no charging and then and then full managed curtailment until the amount of photovoltaics production drops below that curtailment point, in which case the, the microgrid controller sees, oh, actually the PV system now is actually able to produce less than my curtailment point. And then it kind of follows the curtailment point just in case that, that drop in production is from a cloud and not sunset. <laughs> so that you're never getting the ability for have that cloud pass and have a spike in production, in which case our SEL relay would pick up there was a problem and right. trip everything offline. And then so I'm curious, and this was the question, the the kind of the other question that was related to this. Do you know, have you been looking at your data? Do you know if that's happened at this point or you know how often it's happened since you've gone online? Yeah, it yes, it does. I wish I had uh uh, anticipated this question and pulled some of the data from our from our metering platform, which we we do have. And what we're looking for in that metering platform is to see kind of a, a very natural photovoltaic production profile, which which basically means like you're not getting any uh, significant curtailment out of the the photovoltaic or out of the microgrid controller. Some days we get that, other days that we don't. Um, the predictive algorithm that determines like how much to discharge the battery system the night before, maybe it miscalculates because mm. it, it typically thinks like if you had a cloudy day in the past, the next day is likely to be cloudy. Gotcha. And so it sort of weights it that way. And so it may under discharge the battery system the day before. When we hit, if when we hit that full battery state of charge, but we're still like, you know, usually it'll happen around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. What we'll see in our PV production profile is this like um, flattening, this sort of flat top of photovoltaic production profile where the curve will come up, but then it will it will dip and fall and then stay flat. And it'll kind of have a lot of noise and sort of oscillations as the, the microgrid controller kind of does its work, uh, seeing whether or not it can produce any more. And then yes, it will produce more and then it'll bring it back down. And it'll kind of like uh, go through its algorithm to, to maintain that curtailment. Um, until it sort of naturally falls off in the afternoon. And then you'll see that sort of natural decrease in the the sort of bell-shaped photovoltaic production curve that we're used to seeing uh, without, you know, any microgrid controller in play. Gotcha. Cool. Okay. We're getting close to the top of the hour. So I'm going to to move us over to this next slide and kind of this topic. Hopefully we'll be able to do it justice in a relatively short amount of time. But this one to me was quite interesting. And I think it gets to a couple questions out there talking about the um, grid isolated versus uh, grid connected state. And so I think this is a very specific example, Craig, that uh, people probably should at least have in their minds uh, and you know, kind of understanding this. So this had to do with the phase rotation of the utility and some of the loads that you guys interacted. So this was kind of a lessons learned thing uh, for you guys. Yeah, this was this is definitely very hyper specific to to us. I mean, it was uh, something that we kind of un uncovered the hard way during during commissioning, but uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting, worth sharing because it was a really interesting lesson learned about what the capabilities of these grid forming inverters are, and and you know what some of the limitations are. So, the downtown area network uh, at for PGE is a negative phase rotation grid. So basically that means that, you know, the, the A phase peaks, C phase peaks, B phase peaks. And that's um, contrary to a positive phase rotation grid, which is A, B, C in, in sequence order. So when you have a negative phase rotation, uh, I, th I believe most uh, motor loads, especially ones that are not, you know, buffered by a, a variable frequency drive, they you you have to connect the uh, utility lines to that motor, make sure that it is spinning in the right direction to, you know, pump or blow or whatever in the proper direction. And so um, I anticipate that the the motors that are connected, you know, basically across the line in in our our building have a phase transposition at at least two of their terminals so that our negative phase rotation grid produces a forward direction 
pumping mechanical action at the at the motor, right? And we and right next to the main electrical room in the, the living building are some is a um a catch basin with some sewage ejection pumps that are that are down in the pump that that pump out any additional um sewage waste from our in-building composting system. And so when we were uh operating grid connected, everything is working just fine. This is the slide that we're looking at. we we have our grid uh following inverter, which is both a grid following, grid forming battery inverter. So like a multifunction inverter from your earlier slide. And initially we had it connected without any phase transposition at all. So it was basically able to follow a negative phase rotation grid. But if you go to the next slide now, what we found was that when we island now, so the, the grid isolation devices is, is open in this case, and we went to have the um, the the battery inverter go into grid forming mode, and we we do this through an open transition. So we didn't notice any particular issue right at the outset where we're we're trying to transition from um, grid connected to islanded. When we're grid forming, the the battery inverter is only able to, and I think this is the case at least for the battery inverter companies that I've asked recently only able to form in a positive phase rotation sequence. So opposite of what our grid is. And so when that was happening, we noticed some interesting noises coming from the sewage ejection pumps just you know below and outside the main electrical room that did not, did not sound so good. Um, also some interesting smells. So what we realized when we have a, a meter, uh, both the SEL 751 as well as a, a Schneider power meter that we have on our our main breaker, we're able to tell us that you know we're now in a, a positive phase rotation operation, and we're like, wait, weren't we just negative when we were grid connected? Like, what what is what's happening here? Um, and so yeah, came to find that the inverters uh, or the inverter we had. Um, or in fact, two of them, because we went through kind of a, a warranty replacement issue, that they're only able to form in a positive phase rotation. So in order to fix that issue, what we had to do, so if you go to the next slide, is that we had to add in yet another intentional phase transposition between the, the main microgrid switchboard of our building and the grid forming inverter so that when we're grid forming, the inverter is still forming a positive phase rotation, but we're going to transpose that back to be negative. So that matches the, the phase rotation of the utility. And so that matches the, the conventional operation of the rest of the building. So that now all the rest of the, the pump motors in our building are spinning in the right direction again. And so, as, as we said before, the grid forming inverter, if it's going into following mode, it can follow both a positive or negative grid but it can only form positive. So you you have to think about the phase rotation aspects of islanded versus grid connected and what is going to be the right configuration of your, your feeder connections to your battery inverters to make sure it works right, both islanded and grid connected. So it was a really interesting lesson. And I think it's it's one that doesn't get I doesn't really get discussed much and is not talked about in any cut sheets you'll see on your battery inverters. Right, it's, and and like I said, it's it's a pretty specific application I think, but nonetheless, uh, it's one to be aware of, um, especially if you're using them for sewage pumps. Um, uh, pumps, any pumps running in the wrong direction is not a good idea. Um, but yeah, that that's uh, definitely going to cause some extra problems. It seems like. Um, so I don't want to like downplay the solution or, you know, kind of just say it was just as simple as this, but so really it became on the utility side of that transformer, switching the L2 and L3 uh, to mimic what the, mimic the, the phase rotation of the utility when you're operating in backup mode. Is that correct? That's right. And we added yeah. once, and once we did it, we added labels on that circuit breaker to yeah. say that the, the load side terminals of the circuit breaker are intentionally transposed so that uh, if there was an electrician that came in later and was looking at the color sure. coding, they would be like, oh, that's wrong and switch it back. That's exactly. What what idiot did this? Yeah. And yeah. then we also put the same labeling behind the dead front. So just in case somebody took off the dead front without reading it, and then we're looking at the, right. the breaker terminals without the dead front, we were saying, this is correct. You we know, did we, it on purpose. Yeah, we did this on purpose. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 
Okay, well, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, and I, this was a fascinating case study to me. It's just kind of like a lesson learned. It's just something for people to be aware of. You know, think, these are kinds of things that are out there and just kind of help the whole, these systems are much more complex, you know, as opposed to just adding some solar, uh, add a grid following inverter and you just push your, your electrons back towards the utility and call it a day. So, you know, lots of, lots of places to get tripped up. Uh, and so really appreciate you taking the time on that, Craig. Yeah, there absolutely. was one question or comment that I wanted to kind of address as we're closing out here. And so it's kind of, I think, around the application or the, or the way that you are using your system, Craig. And so you are very intentionally using all of the energy that you can to push back into the utility. So you're getting kilowatt hour credits. You're basically offsetting into the utility. Uh, and, you know, maybe that was part of the challenge. Maybe it's part of the financial aspects. You know, it's probably a new, there's probably multiple decision points in that. Um, yep. But the kind of the comment was like, well, this leaves nothing for a blackout or a brownout, or, you know, if if the power goes out at six o'clock, your batteries are dead, you guys are in the dark just as much as your neighbors. Uh, so, yes. So I think that's probably a conscious decision based on the operation of your building. And I guess I would just yep. say that as a building owner or as an operator of the building, you can make a conscious decision and like 50% or you know 75% capacity of the battery. So there's, you know, looking at it, what is the use of the building? What is the the best use of the, your system? And, you know, I think there's just multiple decision points that go into that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, because we're an urban building, we don't have any parking lot. We, we're basically built out to our lot line with the building envelope. Um, we have an indoor battery energy storage room, um, and we had to fight for space for that, for that battery energy storage room amongst other, you know, uses on the first floor retail and mechanic, mechanical and with bike storage and a, and a workout room in the building. And, you know, everyone's got their desires for what they want to do with, sure. with space. And so what we designed the, the battery system, we sized the battery system rather to manage that daily energy arbitrage or time shifting and not and and then the the resiliency was a was was a uh an an added bonus of the complexity of the microgrid controller that was required to perform this function and what i would say is that the microgrid controller we have in the living building as well as most that are available now have what's called a storm avoidance mode so if you know that you are going to have a winter storm coming your way, you can enable that storm avoidance mode. It it overrides the the routine operation of the the grid connected, and and it just tells the the, the microgrid controller just charge the battery, just charge the battery with your solar if you've got it, charge the battery with the grid if you've got it, and you can at least with ours you can say my storm avoidance mode. I want my battery to be completely charged by X time, like. Mm. A day in advance, two days in advance, or a couple hours in advance, and it will attempt to get your battery as fully charged as it can within that time window. So obviously, more advance notice is is good. Now, if we have uh, an earthquake, we're probably not going to have more than a you know minute if we're lucky. Advance notice, probably right. none, right. right? And so those chips will fall where they may. We might get lucky, and we might have a battery system that's charged. But what we do have is we have in our resilience routines that if we start that resilience run with a low battery state of charge, we have a plan for that. We basically will load shed almost all of the load within the building down to just the compost exhaust fans. Okay. And we will sit there and we will wait until the next solar production day. And the, the photovoltaic system will hopefully then recharge that battery system. And we'll then start to reintroduce load through a staged load shedding sequence or load reintroduction sequence um, that's all managed by our microgrid controller. So, uh, so again, yeah, we had to choose. You have and, that ability. And, yep. Yeah, you but, have that ability to kind of control that and and, um, and get get yourself to to a usable system that you need. Yeah, and I think for, in most instances that is going to to be the way in which you are going to actually know about your outage. So whether you know mm -hmm. you have a public safety power shutdown or whether you have a weather event that you know is coming. So it's really just the 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 earthquakes and the um you know the freak acts of nature maybe wildfires or something where you, you don't right. get that ahead yeah right. 
Okay, well, we're right at the top of the hour. I did have a couple of things I wanted to share. So here's our contact info for folks if you have additional questions. I know we didn't get to everybody. So I'm happy to interact with you um, and try and answer some of those questions. And the other thing I just want to kind of point out, we have at Mayfield, we, you know, I mentioned doing, we have a lot of courses that we have. We just released some new courses. So excited to uh, have you look at that um, on the heels of our um, education summit that we did. And so take a look at our website. We definitely have some, some new classes and would love to interact with you on that. And then finally, next month, uh, we are going to be looking at repowering options. And so looking at taking older PV systems and upgrading, bring them up to you know current standards, bring them up to current equipment maybe. Uh, and so that'll be what, we'll, what we're gonna talk about next week, or excuse me, next month. So um, look, look for that uh, invite uh, from us coming up. Craig, thank you so much. Uh, I know that we could continue going on, um, but yeah, there's uh, yeah. plenty to talk about here. I really appreciate your time and being able to, to share kind of what you've learned on your system. Yeah, thanks so much, Ryan. It's great uh, to ask Mayfield anything. It's a great platform. Uh, hopefully, you'll have us back. Great. Appreciate that. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.